our discussion will take place in the form of two rounds of questions to the panelists. And I'll ask each panelist to answer my question with a short statement of about five minutes max. After the first round, we'll have a short Q&A session. Everybody is very much welcome to raise questions during the debate in the Q&A box. Q&A is followed by the second round of questions. After that, we'll have another Q&A session at the end of our panel discussion. I will give the floor to ITS Vice Chair Jason Welly, who will give the closing words. So let's now start off, uh, kick off the first round of uh, the discussion, focusing on how the industry will manage its supply chain in the future. And I'm asking first uh, Björn Rupp, uh, Björn, how in general industry will manage a global supply chain against the background of growing uncertainties and trade restrictions? Uh, thank you, Georg. Uh, well, um, let me look at this from uh, two different perspectives, a technical perspective and a political perspective. Um, of course, we have already covered quite a bit on the uh, political perspective, but um, let me uh, start with a technical perspective. Um, with the advent of 5G, um, the global supply chain too will in the long term undergo a rather fundamental transformation, of course, and that will it make, make it more akin to traditional IT, I'd say. Um, first of all, um, exploiting the full potential of 5G services will um, entail obviously many changes in the network, making it on the one hand much more flexible, but on the other hand also a much more complex beast um, than the traditional telecom infrastructure uh, that we know and that's characterized mostly by proprietary hardware platforms and interfaces. So with that, uh, when you talk about 5G and virtual network functions and so on, and uh, with these virtual network functions becoming uh, deployed closer to or sometimes even on the customer's premises, um, and when you look at what that means in practice, I guess it becomes clear pretty quickly that this means two things. First, uh, unbundling of hardware and software, and second, they may actually be different parties procuring the hardware and the software. And um, this trend will in turn require open interfaces, which in turn opens the space up to new suppliers that uh, supply specific solutions for specific needs. Um, of course, as always, uh, there are exceptions and caveats. In this case, I'd say uh, caveat number one is that uh, there will still be significant barriers to entry, um, for instance, scalability, um, the new need for global service and support network, and so on. And uh, caveat two is that um, some of the existing vendors are, of course, already trying to counter that threat by integrating uh, ever more functionality in one single box. So. There are justifiable performance reasons for that as well, but uh, there are, of course, also, uh, let's say, strategic incentives from a competitive point of view. So that's a technical perspective. Um, 5G will change a lot of things, and that will also mean that the supply chain changes. Um, then there is the political perspective. Um, you already mentioned uh, trade restrictions, and um, that's just one aspect of the challenges on the political side. Um, we covered a lot of that already in the uh, preceding session, so I'll keep myself brief, uh, but uh, going forward, I think we can assume the political perspective to gain in prominence. Um, and obviously, as mobile network infrastructure becomes ever more important uh, for our lives and the economy in general, I guess it's safe to say that we can expect national security to be cited ever more often in the context of procurement decisions. And those procurement decisions may no longer be just the mobile network operators to take. Um, there may be many other uh, parties and interests that will play into these procurement decisions. And um, I guess it will mean less control over the procurement decision by the MNO by himself. And that brings in additional uncertainty and suggests that an MNO may want to hedge its bets uh, also from a geographical point of view. And that was also what the uh, some of the panelists in the previous sessions already pointed out uh, you will want to hedge your bets not only in terms of uh, who is supplying what but also from where and you may well be subject to uh, um, the decisions made in outside jurisdictions combining these two the technical and the political perspective i guess um, 
will have a more open supply chain, um, which depending on what point of view you take, you might also call a more fragmented supply chain. And uh, that will, of course, bring new challenges. Um, I mean, how do you vet all these vendors, old and new? Uh, that's a gargantuan task by itself. And uh, that will, by necessity, involve a lot of trade-offs. So uh, one of them is, for instance, a trade-off between innovation and uh, reliability. And uh, that, again, will make the supply chain uh, more similar to the traditional IT industry. And I think if uh, that's the key takeaway, uh, um, then uh, it is that really the transformation that 5G and the other technologies that are coming online are bringing with them it really means that the supply chain will be more akin to traditional IT. I think that's really the key takeaway um, in terms of separation of hardware, software, and so on. Uh, expected to be, to look more like uh, traditional IT. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Björn. Um, I think that's a very interesting insight, and uh, one of the aspects that maybe we'll touch upon this later in the course of the debate is. Uh, system integration will become a very important thing. If you have a variety of different vendors, different systems, the whole thing, to, to stitch the whole thing together uh, is a challenge in itself. Uh, so, um, I would now like to go on uh, to Professor Seifert, but obviously he couldn't manage to be on the platform, on the conference. Uh, maybe he has difficulties in dialing in. Uh, so I will then go to the next speaker, which is then Torsten Küpper. And Torsten, um, my question to you is, from the perspective of a U.S. semiconductor company, what shall Europe do to be good positioned when it comes to supply chain management security? How to increase digital sovereignty in Europe? Do we need European champions and what does it mean? And how can we protect European assets? That was one of the things which we have discussed in the first session already, European assets like the .eu or other things or intellectual property and any other things. Uh, so, Torsten, what is, what is your view at this? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer this question, of course, as a representative of a US ICT company, but as well as a European citizen. Uh, because that's <laughs> my role and that's I'm as well. Um, yeah, we heard already that uh, we will have in the future not only technical challenges, but as well maybe geopolitical challenges. And this means that what we heard as well, uh, diversification will be key and it will be very, very important for Europe and other regions as well to build on own competences and to reduce dependencies to some extent. And that is why digital sovereignty is uh, key to the European uh, Commission and uh, to a lot of member states. Uh, the question is, uh, what uh, shall we do and uh, in which fields uh, shall we really strive for more digital sovereignty? There are already a lot of promising initiatives as well in Europe. So you have, for instance, a European Foundry initiative. So Foundry is a manufacturing site for semiconductors. Currently, Europe is very much dependent as well on the US as, and on China, Taiwan, Asia. So and currently you see a lot of activities, for instance, in the European Commission to close the gap and uh, maybe to establish an own ecosystem which will lead to a, a high performing foundry as well. You have this ORAN initiative, because if we go to the telco sector, um, currently we have this uh, three, four suppliers, big suppliers, which are providing infrastructure, hardware, equipment uh, throughout the world and in Europe. And um, all these, uh, we, we mentioned this in the context of Open RAN, all these equipment is not interoperated. So you cannot connect, for instance, in the RAN network, a Nokia antenna with an Ericsson base station or with a Huawei base station or the other way around. Um, so in this regard, it means that there are a lot of dependencies and you see a lot of push from policymakers as well as from the operators to change the system and to come to an open interoperable uh, RAN infrastructure in the future, which will allow market entries of new challengers and will reduce dependencies as well. On the other side, I think it's super important for Europe to keep uh, the European champions and the global champions you already have, because the discussion is always about how to close the gap. 
But if you see, for instance, in the telco sector and the telco infra sector, you have Ericsson and Nokia. And to some extent, of course, within a legal framework, especially regarding and respecting competition law, you have to make sure that these companies can survive as well in the future, that they will not lose their position in the global race for inventing and uh, yeah, designing future-proof technologies, 6G, 7G. Currently, we only talk about 5G, but of course, the engineers are already one, two, three steps ahead. And this means that as well, these companies need to earn money in the future. This means they have to generate revenues. They have to keep their profitable businesses like the licensing business, of course, without uh, putting too much harm on other vertical industries, which are dependent on ICT technology as well. So we need to find the right balance in this regard. And um, of course, as well, so Open RAN, on one hand, it will uh, allow, uh, will reduce dependencies and uh, will allow new players to enter into this market. On the other side, it will, of course, cannibalize the business for the European global players like Ericsson and Nokia. So it has to be very well and very smart managed, right? So this is the telco sector. Going one step back to the foundry. So currently what we do have is we have the design capacities for high-performing chips predominantly in the US with Intel, with my company, AMD. You have the manufacturing capacities predominantly in Asia, but Europe is not that bad off because you have here companies like ASML, which is a Dutch company, which provides tool to produce the semiconductors. And you have our arm still in the UK, which provides uh, the architecture for high performing chips. So currently, of course, we are discussing or there are discussions in the market that NVIDIA wants to take over and we will see what the future of this will be. But still, Europe has something currently, at least, to still so to guarantee the balance of power into this market, because if there are threats from one region or the other, Europe can counter by at least uh, making very clear that the world is dependent on European technology if it comes to the tools. So this is something where Europe should focus on as well. Um, but we see as well that the whole security debate is really, as Bjorn said very much correctly, it's not only a technical security debate. Nowadays, it's really much more how can we guarantee always to have access to spare parts, to new hardware, to software patches, and so on and so far. And this really dominates the whole discussion and as well supply chain management discussion and uh, strategy much, much more than the technical security in the strict sense currently. Yeah? But to come back to the answer, diversification is key and really focus on your own reliabilities to counter uh, some geopolitical threats and to ensure a balance of power in the market. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, Torsten. Uh, this is a great insight. and. Uh, for providing also this kind of helicopter perspective over the whole thing we are discussing here. Um, and I think we will go deeper to that. Uh, let me now move on to Manuel, Manuel Carpio. Um, you have been working many, many years for Telefonica as a CSIO. Uh, from a telecom operator perspective, what are the challenges and how to manage a multi-vendor ecosystem? For example, interoperability, standardization, limitations for vendors and so so what's your view at this thank you very much um george and, and my peers uh, to invite me to participate in this interesting meeting uh, this is an, a very interesting long time uh, concern for the uh, telco operators the supply chain security is not um, recent but it is uh, long, long time concern, as you say that, and it is not so easy to manage. Uh, it's the duty of the operators to promote a free and fair competition between network equipment and system providers, because this uh, eventually uh, benefits the shareholders and provides greater resilience to the to the whole. Right? Managing multi-vendor environment is challenging for the operator, but at the end of the day, it's, that's what the engineers use to do, to, to do and we are for. So it's our duty, right, to, to manage. So it's not a problem, it's not that concern to manage a multi-vendor environment, right? How do, uh, how we do, do that, right? So, uh, maybe you, do remem you remember the, 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 the very famous um, uh, saying 
that Mr. Reagan said to Mikhail Gorbachev uh, when signing the, the, the SALT II uh, agreement. He, he always said the same, trust but verify. And Mikhail Gorbachev say, hey, Mr. Reagan, Mr. President, you always say the same. Yes, I like it. So the question is trust but verify. So we rely in certification in the systematic process of certification and qualification of supply chains. And uh, I mean, not only in the first row of key suppliers, but upstreams of, of them, right? It's important to have to be in mind that's important concept in upstream in there, not the, 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 the operator itself, but the, the key manufacturer, the key uh, suppliers. Uh, when I was visiting the, the Huawei manufacturing facilities in Shenzhen, they told us an astonishing uh, fact that they were also in China the, the target of cyber attacks trying to uh, inject in their firmware uh, malware for them to be the, the, the gateway, the transporters of this malware to our networks. So it is important, the concept of security upstream in the uh, in the whole supply chain right so companies have adopted a variety of practices that help them to manage their cybersecurity uh, chain risk right these practices include administrative organizational and for sure technical measures administrative uh, measures range from security requirements included in every rfp uh, contracts uh, of thing evidence uh, in the suppliers in the key suppliers that they are doing their security obligation upstreams right a uh, track and trace programs uh, establish the the, 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 the the provenance of all parts components and systems and require for sure external third-party audits and certification from an organizational point of view it works for us the uh, the settlement of what the what we as a pioneers on this in telefonica we called the PCIRT. what does it stands for product security incident response teams this is uh, once a vendor uh, is accepted in the in the in the formal supply chain a security team from the operator shifts to the facilities in the manufacturing uh, country uh, working along uh, with them, with the, with the engineers from the manufacturing on site to address in real time the vulnerability and security gaps in real time, right? That's important. A, a lot of different, I want to bother you with a lot of different controls we apply in, the, in this organizational, but from a technical point of view, I would like to step in the importance of source code and binaries uh, digitally signed. Uh, and currently today using the blockchain uh, distributed ledger technology. This is key to maintain the trust and the confidentiality and integrity on the software being applied in the network equipment. Sorry for the extension of my intervention. No, no, that's perfect. Uh, and thank you very much for sharing your hands-on experience uh, and, and bringing in the operator perspective. That's, that's great. Um, we have we have enough time to um, engage in a in a in a discussion among the panelists, and I, I just wanted to ask Björn, uh, would you like to pick up on what Torsten or Manuel has said, and how does it, uh, from your um, business perspective and experience, how how does this how does this um, how can you reflect on this, and uh, what do you think about these things, what we heard? Yeah, I mean, um, what uh, Taurus said in, in particular is, of course, uh, a key a key issue, like um, where do you source what components from? And uh, that's actually become an ever more, it's going to become an ever more challenging task. Um, uh, again, both from a technical side of uh, things, as well as from the uh, political side of things. And um, just looking at chipsets alone, that's a huge challenge. Um, obviously, um, as uh, I guess uh, a lot of people are well aware, um, 
uh, they are, form the basis of, of everything. And if you uh, have introduced uh, some backdoors in there, uh, you have a lot of opportunities uh, to also compromise the layers above that. Um, at the same time, uh, there are new opportunities for chipset vendors, as I'm sure Torst is also very well aware, because uh, for a company like Qualcomm, but also for others, uh, you can certainly expand into a new role and actually become a vendor of not just uh, chipsets, but also of uh, entire subsystems, something that would not be possible uh, before. Now for the MNO as a customer, and again, that's actually, by the way, the next question, like who is the customer? Is it a traditional MNO? Um, that definition is also weakening quite a bit because um, again, you might have parts of the network actually belonging to the end customer. Let's say you have a big uh, automotive manufacturer, he will have part of the network infrastructure on premises and under his own management. Um, then only you're lying on a traditional MNO for, for wide area network traffic, for instance. Um, so <laughs> you already see that with, with all that complexity, as there are lots of opportunities, but also uh, I guess there's quite a bit of uh, work to be done for the procurement departments as they need to adapt themselves to managing not just the relationship with you know one, two, or at most a handful of suppliers, but a wider range of suppliers, and then also like gaining that experience and knowledge how to best judge, okay, now in this particular field, we may no longer uh, need to be bound to one of our existing supplier, we may have new options, and then you need to evaluate uh, what these options are, and then very important, of course, what is the long-term viability of that? If you plan a network, you don't plan for um, the next, uh, let's say, one, two, three, four years, you plan for a decade or longer, so you need to uh, have pretty good confidence in the supplier. And so that entire decision space becomes uh, far more complicated, but also far more interesting, I guess. If I were in the procurement department of one of these MNOs, I think it would be an interesting time. I mean, that we really mean this from a positive point of view. Thank you, Piran. Um, I think that's a uh, it's it's a great it's a great overview of what you're providing us here. And you mentioned uh, procurement department. I think procurement um, under the scenarios which we are discussing here. Um, so, how will the supply chain uh, of the future look like? Um, I wanted to ask Manuel uh, if you go back to your experience in 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 the in the um, as an, in a network operator. Uh, is, isn't there an enormous paradigm shift what we can observe here and what does it mean and how will network operators deal with that? Did you mean the, the, the procession department? Yeah. Okay, this is a good question because the, the, the purchase department is cost and price driven, right? Their benefit um, comes from the fact to reduce cost. And normally security is inside this reduction, right? So the, the, the chief information security officer and the security team is always fighting against the purchasing department because security, security people, security team wants to increase the security, increase the controls, and it is always against the cost involved in, inside in, in the built-in facilities and the in-built-in uh, uh, features of the products and systems, right? So it's, it's amazing because you, our, our aim is to introduce in the, in the uh, framework agreements with the manufacturers uh, a number of different controls, but not always the, the, the purchasing department agrees with this. Uh, okay, so that's the, 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 the problem with the purchase department. We put a, aside several certain uh, manufacturers because security, they, they don't get it, the minimum security level, but instead of this, the, uh, the, the, the purchase department recover them uh, from, the, from the river and they put in the, in the top of the, of, the, of, the, of the race. So finally, uh, our, 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 the, the, the security department in the past years, I mean, uh, was not always the, 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 the good guys in the, in the picture, right? Yeah, good guy and bad guy within the company. It, 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 is, it is not a Pacific uh, relationship. 
<laughs> security with purchase department, right? Yeah, thank you very much. This is this is a very interesting insight. Um, how does it work? And uh, I think these these challenges are, are growing, and it's it's not getting easier. Um, Torsten, from your perspective, um, do do you want to pick up on those things? Yeah, of yeah. course. Um, so. Um, because this is very much related to the open RAN discussion, it has pros and cons. But Richard from Vodafone has uh, the previous session very clearly said that uh, the market needs more suppliers of infrastructure equipment. And this means definitely the trend to open RAN is not stoppable. Yeah, because competition brings innovation, competition brings the prices down, and competition reduces dependencies. And these are three very, very strong arguments. Um, which drives the whole discussion uh, towards uh, Open RAN. But Open RAN, of course, has uh, for a traditional supply chain in an operator a lot of challenges. First thing is liability. So if you have only one supplier, let's say Ericsson, Nokia, or Huawei, if something goes wrong in the network, you know where to address to. It's definitely then Ericsson's fault or responsibility, or Nokia's responsibility, accountability, whatsoever. If you now have a mix of different vendors, so one is providing the base station, another one the antenna, the third one the software, and so on and so far, it's already very, very difficult uh, to structure and to find out who is a liable partner. Um, who has provided the equipment which causes a mail function. So this is the first question, how to solve the liability issues, but uh, clever and smart supply chain managers will, will find a way to solve it. Another problem though is the performance, because you can say if everything comes from one hand, software as well as hardware, firmware, whatsoever, you can say that it's of course optimized to interwork with each other, and maybe this is a performance issue and increases performance. And personally, personally, I think, or at least in the transformation phase from the current traditional um, hardware setup to open RAN, this might be an issue because in the beginning, one has to learn to run and to learn to walk. In the beginning, for sure, there will be performance issues. But I think over the time, the benefits will prevail and the performance will be even better because I think more vendors, more infrastructure providers will bring more competition which will enhance innovation and performance. And the third thing is security. Um, at least this is one thing one has to consider. So if somebody, if the whole equipment comes only from one vendor, then let it be a European one, a Chinese one, doesn't matter. Um, so it is more or less a black box because only the vendor really knows what's inside. How does the software interoperate with the hardware and what's in and so on and so far. I think multi-vendors in an open environment, in open RAM, so which will provide transparency as well, because they will to some extent control each other and will have visibility what other companies and other equipment is capable to do or not capable to do. So I think in this regard, it will increase as well security. But the challenge though, having said all the benefits whatsoever, is from an operator perspective, of course, still the CapEx OPEX issue. So it will not help the operator if the price for the hardware goes down because you have a lot of uh, competition now in the field. Uh, but on the other side, you need a lot of people which uh, will cause OPEX issues, uh, which have to manage the whole um, uh, ecosystem, which have to integrate it, which have to go after the things and have to uh, organize and uh, to manage the whole supply chain. So this is a trade-off and this is, uh, of course, as well, a challenge for the operators to find the right balance. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Torsten. Uh, that is, um, in a way, also leading um, to to the next to the next round uh, with my next round of questions to you. Um, how to actually deal with the with the security challenges? And uh, but let's make now a short break and see whether if we have any questions coming up in the Q and A box. But it doesn't seem the case. So let me repeat at this point, um, our audience is kindly invited uh, to raise questions by using the, uh, the three dots on the top, on, on, on the very bottom of the, of the uh, screen, on the bottom right. Uh, so you have three dots and if you click here, then the Q&A box opens and you can raise questions. So you're kindly invited to use this. Um, as we have obviously no questions now, uh, then let me start the second round of questions to the uh, to the panelists. And this will be more specific now to security. 
so the question or the, the, the theme is how the industry will meet the associated security challenges um, associated with the subject we have just discussed. And I would like to start again with Björn asking, against the backdrop of an increasing variety of attack vectors, most IT managers would avoid using the same vendor for an intrusion detection system and the routing and switching equipment on the other hand. So what can the telecom industry learn from this example? Uh, excellent question. Um, I guess the uh, overarching mantra uh, in terms of learning is uh, anything or anyone. Um, I mean, in the uh, traditional IT security world, anyone assumes that a PC sourced from a quote unquote reputable supplier is more trustworthy just because the hardware comes from a reputable source? Of course not, right? So uh, the discussions that we've been having uh, this year uh, about a specific supplier of telecom equipment uh, being singled out is, is a bit absurd in that, in that context. It's really like a thing from the past. Um, when you look ahead, uh, it seems completely absurd to rely on any vendor uh, to provide security for its own products. I mean, first of all, there is this uh, disintegration, uh, which we already discussed, uh, hardware, software, uh, various components for several specialized functions, virtualized network functions, and so on and so on. And um, then second, uh, there's an overarching question of would the vendor actually ever be uh, properly incentivized to uh, fix its own products? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no, uh, depending on, depending on uh, what that vendor looks like. And um, so it doesn't really make sense to, to uh, expect that uh, the security of a given product um, is automatically taken for granted just because that uh, supplier is expected to take care of it. So the way uh, I see it uh, in an independent industry of, for instance, uh, firewall vendors, uh, suppliers of intrusion detection system and so on will thrive just in the, just like in the IT world. And that's already happening in the telecoms world when you look at um, signaling security in particular, um, just the very recent past, I mean, in telecom terms, like the last maybe um, four years or so, uh, there has been uh, a new segment coming into life of, for instance, SS7 firewall vendors, but also in other areas where you actually see uh, the trends from the general IT world uh, make their way into the traditional telecoms world. So uh, in the end, don't look at the vendor plate, um, look for the best value in security. And uh, you asked about what can the telecom industry learn from this change? I guess the key learning is really, again, don't trust anything or anyone and uh, take advantage of what you may want to call you know, the commoditization of the industry and uh, the separation of its individual components by selecting what best fits your specific needs and requirements. And uh, with this new world, you actually can do that. You're no longer bound to just, you know, okay, I can choose, do I choose vendor A or B? No, I have a choice and um, I have a choice of a great many vendors. And crucially, I don't have to trust the vendor that's supplying my uh, switching equipment to also look after its security. You can separate these tasks and you should really. That's a very interesting point, uh, Bjorn, because that means uh, what we hear, uh, I mean, this debate, if you boil it down, the debate, which is also held on the, on the political level, it's very often about, okay, vendor A is more trustworthy uh, than vendor B. Yeah, And we have categories like high-risk vendors and stuff like this. So what you are saying is uh, they are all on the same trust level, so to say and you need to design your system in this in or your network in a way uh, that the the vendor is not in the position to control himself is that I, what you're saying i wouldn't say that they're all in the same trust level i mean there are certain certainly some vendors whom you may prefer over others for various reasons um but in the end there is no reason to trust any of them right and that's not necessarily by bad intentions or whatever, um, there may be implementation errors, whatever, um, 
by definition, all equipment is buggy. And uh, I have yet to see the equipment that is, you know, performing exactly to specifications, never has an issue, never uh, ex exposes any bugs. It's just not happening. It's software, right? And um, as that software is becoming an ever more prominent role, there will be more and more issues. And so regardless of whether you, uh, you know, have issues that may be caused uh, by certain intentions or not, you don't want to take it for granted that this works just like the way it is. Um, and again, the concept of just saying, well, this is vendor A, and so we all have, all have to go with vendor A or with vendor B uh, because vendor C is not trustworthy. It seems like a like a really like a like something from the past. Again, as as that example that I brought, like just because you buy a PC from some vendor would you say that okay now the entire system is secure no because there are so many layers and so many um uh, components especially in on the, on the software side that uh, it actually even if you had the best intentioned vendor it would be pretty much impossible to guarantee the security of the entire network because uh, as each vendor will only be responsible for uh, let's say shrinking slice of that uh, big cake, uh, you can't really make him responsible for, for the entire network. Okay. Um, I'm, um, I would like now to pick up on questions I have received in the meantime. And one of them is, um, what is Europe doing or can do to address its strategic vulnerability around semiconductor supply and other IT crucial resources that are only at largely supplied outside of the EU? This is a question from uh, one of our attendees. So what, um, who would like to pick this up? Yeah, I can say something to this actually. Yeah, um, yeah it's very difficult actually, because uh, to uh, produce semiconductors, to have a foundry, a European foundry, which is capable to provide high performance, uh, high performing chips, very, very difficult and hard to achieve. It's a long way, a lot of investment. It's not only investment, it is as well know-how and not only technical know-how, so it is as well how to build a supply chain and an ecosystem for this. So hard to achieve. But the question is, what does Europe really need? Do we need uh, three, five, seven nanometers, uh, which are really used in high performance ship, which usually are used in smartphones or in uh, telecommunication uh, equipment, or does Europe need uh, to guarantee the supply of chips which are used for key industries in Europe, like the cars, the automobile industry, or the pharma industry, the chemics, automation, whatsoever? I mean, these kind of chips, they don't have this very high qualities, three, five, seven nanometers. Uh, so for them, it's maybe already sufficient to have 20 nanometers, 30 nanometers. So therefore, what you can see in uh, strategic discussions within the various policy stakeholders, in the European Commission and in the member states, if that the current thinking is going to a two-way approach, a two-faced approach. Phase one is really to focus on, let's say, mid-level chips and low-level chips, which are needed for, for European vertical industries, key sectors, that it is ensured that in the worst case scenario, Europe can ensure the supply, that the production will not uh, run down, right? So in the second step, so if you have established the first ecosystem, is then maybe really to look at the very, very high uh, qualities, which means currently five, seven nanometers production. Yeah, but this is, let's say, one step after the other. Uh, I doubt that you can directly compete with Taiwan or with the US if it comes to uh, capability. So the whole world currently is more or less dependent on TSMC on Taiwan, in Taiwan. Um, so you have a little bit in uh, in Samsung in Korea, a little bit in the US, but predominantly it's Taiwan who's providing the ships. But you see as well that the US is uh, having a lot of initiatives. So TSMC is building two foundries there. Uh, Intel as well as Samsung are investing in the US as well. And in Germany, uh, there is a big initiative in the Ministry of Economy. And in Europe, there's an important project of common European interest, which will fund uh, semiconductors as well. So I think uh, the awareness is there, the will is there, and there will be results as well. Uh, thank you, Thorsten. And we have all heard uh, in a couple of speeches from Commissioner Breton uh, that um, the European uh, semiconductor industry or kind of uh, a push for the European semiconductor industry is vital for digital sovereignty. Uh, so this is something the European Commission, on the political level at least, have picked up on. And so I think the uh, 
Um, so awareness is there, definitely. Yeah, yeah. so you have to be awareness yeah, is there. Absolutely. And then, um, yeah, I would like then to um, uh, go to another question. Um, we have, um, I think, one of the most important and, and, and interesting things um, what we see in the sector is, is open RAN. So um, I, I wanted to ask uh, both Manuel and Torsten, maybe Manuel can start. So can you elaborate a little bit further about the key elements of sovereignty and the role of open RAN in that, in that combination? Manuel, what do you think about this? Okay. Um, yes, in, in my opinion, open run, as my peers said before, can be one of the um, ways to commoditize the hardware and the software in, in, in new networks, uh, specifically 5G networks, uh, and specifically in, 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 in access networks in this new technology, right? Uh, open interfaces, uh, modularity of, of uh, systems, standards and public specifications could balance the playing field uh, and result uh, eventually in a greater and fair competition between players in the manufacturing side. So, so I, I, I support uh, strongly the open run uh, efforts, right? And this is, I think, is, is, is one way, an important way, not the only way to uh, finally obtain the, this trust as I mentioned before, um, during the during decades from the from the very very beginning of the telecommunications uh, uh, industry, even with the with the invention of the, the telephone itself, uh, the, the the manufacturers tried to gain a, a power in the in the new advance and new uh, discovering in the, in the in the technology, right? But uh, the, the history show us that did, uh, this uh, last for a couple of years because immediately new technology, new advance, uh, finally are commoditized, right? And this is what will occur in the 5G environment, in my opinion, right? During these years, some of the leaders in the in the 5G industry has the the, the research, and what's important for you to know it. It's a question for, for us, for European countries, to be able to invest the, the money in us in research and in a continuous ongoing effort in, in research and development to cover the gap with these leaders, right? But the, finally, the final picture, the final landscape will be uh, the same always. Uh, the, 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 the new technology uh, ends with the commoditization, the, the, the lowering of the cost involved in the manufacturing the open standards, open interfaces, and modularity. So it's, it's clear for me that this is, uh, I don't know if it will be a one, two years uh, uh, from now on, right? But this will be the, 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 the end of the 5G fight uh, that currently we are undergoing. Yeah. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, Torsten, any views on this? Because what we can see is, I mean, open run is, is, uh, is, uh, um, and followed by Telefonica, by Deutsche Telekom, by Vodafone. Uh, so what is your view at this? Yeah, as I said, uh, so the operators have an interest because it uh, enhances uh, innovation and brings the prices down because there will be more competition. But the problem is, well, how does it fit into the uh, digital sovereignty debate? Well, currently you have predominantly in Europe three vendors and all networks in Europe are more or less built by these uh, three vendors. Um, if we now talk about 5G, 5G is not a substitute to 3G or 4G. 5G means fifth generation, yes, but uh, it's an evolution. So uh, in the first place, it will be built out of the existing 4G equipment. And here comes the problem. Given that we don't have interoperability between the three vendors, if you have started or if you have already a legacy network built uh, with 4G equipment from vendor A, usually you need to uh, uh, equip and uh, to, to use the 5G equipment from the same vendor, because it's an evolution, not a substitute, to build the 5G out of this. And this is the lockdown. If you have started with 4G from the uh, economic perspective, it makes no sense to change the vendor. It makes much more sense to use the same vendor for 5G, given that there's no interoperability. But if we would now have open RAM, 
um, this would mean that it would be easily to exchange uh, vendors, right, and equipment, and you could then build, if we would have already open RAM, a 5G network, you could use hardware from vendor B and put it on the equipment, 4G equipment on vendor A, which is currently not possible. And this means you are bound, you are locked in and you are not sovereign, you have to stick with one vendor. Right. And open RAN will open the door that you can bring in new companies and this will give you as a customer sovereignty. Yeah, thank you, Thorsten. Um, I'm just um, looking uh, at the at the Q&A box and um, I see that we have a very active um, person in the, in the audience. And one of the question is politicians want to increase national control over the Internet. This challenges the global design and operation of the internet. Best, for, best effort forwarding of received packages, regardless of content, originator, or addressee. How do you view this development? I mean, for me, uh, this question uh, it very much, I mean, this rings a bell. Uh, new IP, so Splinternet, everything, uh, these new kind of things which are coming and debated also in, in, um, in the ITU. Uh, is any of the... Um, of the panelists um, prepared to or interested to pick up on this question? I'm afraid so. Uh, that was uh, my PhD thesis 20 years ago. <laughs> 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 yeah. Best effort versus uh, integrated services, dif differentiated services, and uh, when can you prioritize certain packets over others? That's, that's a debate that. Uh, uh, we can have, but I'm afraid that it will take another 30 minutes of this. Um, which, which, we, which, we don't, which we don't have. We have only 12 minutes left. I'm happy to respond to the, uh, to the, um, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, participant privately. Okay. Okay, great. We'll, uh, we'll take care of that. Um, the, uh, the other question from this participant is, there are very few examples of government initiated technical developments resulting in commercially viable and effective products. Why would this change now? This is, uh, of course, a very tricky question because uh, it would require a judgment from, from our side or from the panelists, um, uh, how kind of promising the, the, uh, the initiative open um, open strategic autonomy is. Uh, is anybody prepared to respond to that? It's 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 rather in the political d domain, yeah? I mean, <laughs> don't want to uh, jump to the forefront, but again, GSM uh, would not exist without some concerted uh, political effort, um, just like many other standards. So the, I guess maybe one would want to reword the question like, um, uh, the government is not necessarily good at, at shaping a product, but maybe in its ideal form, it's good at um, uh, defining a framework and uh, allowing us to agree on a standard that makes that maybe a bit more easier than would otherwise be possible. Yeah. Based um, on of this, as a representative of a company, I would always say, well, Policies and regulation is only the second best solution to tackle a problem, gives the flexibility uh, to the companies. But generally, um, um, if we really uh, look at the whole picture, maybe the market has not always worked perfectly in the past. Because uh, it has been mentioned in the previous discussion by Richard as well, 20 years ago, we had, if it comes to telecom uh, infrastructure, we had 10, 12 uh, suppliers. Um, of infrastructure. This means more competition, more innovation, and all the benefits which come from competition and functioning markets. Currently, I see at least in Europe only three, and this is maybe only the second best solution. So maybe as Bjorn just said, a framework which gives somehow a little bit guidance and stimulates a little bit more competition and more innovation is something we should look at. But very reluctantly, as a representative of a company, it has to be very smart if we talk about this. Yeah. And don't overregulate. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, as a moderator, it's not my role to uh, to pick up on questions and answer those questions, but uh, uh, I'm very tempted to do so <laughs> in an exceptional way. Uh, there. No, I think I, I think that I mean it's a very good question um, and um, and puts uh, I mean 
challenges, of course, the initiatives, whether they are Gaia X and uh, and and cloud cloud strategy of the union uh, or the uh, open strategic autonomy. I think it is something um, I, I, li I like these ideas, but of course they are simply on the political level only. They need to go down to the operational level. They need to be operationalized. And I, I think uh, the only thing I can say as an observer for, for decades of what's going on here in that sector, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. We'll see whether um, the commission together with the parliament and the council will be able uh, also with the help of the industry and the whole sector to make to to bring that down to the operational level that is i mean that's the that's the the, the critical the critical point of the whole debate yeah um yeah we are coming uh, closer to the uh, to the end of this session and i would like to i have a couple of other questions still in my in my pocket mm -hmm. um the um there is another thing which uh, I'm raising, and that's probably a question for Manuel. So what can the telecom industry, meaning network operators and network equipment vendors, learn from the IT industry in terms of virtualization, disaggregation between hardware, software, etc.? Uh, Bjorn already touched a little bit upon this, but I wanted to listen to what Manuel uh, says about this. Okay, we, from from the network sector, uh, people from technical uh, teams can learn a lot from the IT. The, the what is uh, the the back end uh, or business uh, uh, sector in, in in the companies, uh, even in the in the in the new technologies like new new uh, fashions like uh, uh, virtualization and software defined networks and so on, right? But Bear in mind that what's more important for uh, network people, uh, network teams, are the availability of the services, right? Um, uh, people fear the software uh, normally because software software uh, comes involved in a lot of uh, different uh, mistakes, poor quality, and what's most most important I'm fearing by the team the, 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 the network team people that this is a single point of failure so, so the hypervisor and the platforms behind the the, 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 the virtualization and and the software defined networks is one of the of the ables that this is the the single point of failure for for network teams right so we are people are moving to this uh, technology right because uh, of course, they provide with uh, a lot of flexibility and um, real-time uh, response in case of uh, troubles in network. But at the same time, they they want to control the the um, inherent um, products of software uh, in a completely software software network. So that's the point. There is a balance, and um, for sure, in, little by little. Uh, the, the network teams will adopt this new technology, the, 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 the virtualization uh, of the uh, network functions and the software defined network and many others like uh, blockchain, like uh, cloud environments and so on. And the, and the new one, don't, don't forget that is a zero trust technologies, that this is the, 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 the new cry. Do not yeah. So the, what you are saying, in essence, is this train is unstoppable. So yes, 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 yeah. of course. But little by little, in the network environment, because people in the, in the network field uh, take in account the, the availability and the control of the of the networks, and they normally they don't rely too much in uh, in software as a new adopters, new early adopters of the new new new, new technologies, right? Thank you. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, and there is one of my favorite questions I would now like to raise to the to the whole panel, and that is um, Open RAN. Uh, I mean, everybody speaks about Open RAN; and it's a very fashionable thing. Um, and what I mean, can vendors escape from the vendor dilemma, meaning of a shrinking number of traditional vendors? 
by moving the whole thing towards open RAN? Or does it simply mean you are replacing one dependency by another one, meaning the dependency on Intel processors or stuff like this, if you look at the Whitetail hardware? Um, who wants to pick up on this? It's for all panelists. It's the closing round now. Björn, would you like to start? And then let's go over to Torsten and closing manual. I, I don't want to be the movie star. No, no, no. We, we move now to Björn. All right. Well, um, in a way, yes, sure. You, you're always dependent on someone. Um, uh, on, at the chipset level, sure. But uh, I guess you could argue that the dependency is uh, spread over far more shoulders in this case, because you're relying on something far more generic than before. Um, when you look at you, you said Intel chips, you know, that they power a lot of uh, different devices and systems. And so um, you may not be as dependent uh, on uh, those uh, as when you are dependent on a specific vendor that supplies just for a specific, I wouldn't say niche, <laughs> that would be an insult to the telecoms industry, but at least to, to only a specific segment. So yes, you're always dependent on someone, um, but um, maybe you can at least uh, level out a little bit such that uh, the dependency is broader and that ideally you can also uh, easier go for alternatives, um, competing products, competing uh, solutions and compatible. That's the entire economic, economic theory of compatible and vertical as well as horizontal that comes into play here. And uh, the more open interfaces you have uh, and the more they're really open, uh, the more choice you have at least in theory. Yeah. Thorsten, what's, what's your view, exchanging one dependency with another one? Yeah, so I fully at first agree on everything what Bjorn just said. There will be always some dependencies, but they will be reduced significantly because currently it's impossible for any new company to enter into this market. Even if it is already a blue chip company, in my view, it would be impossible to create a new infrastructure company, a new challenger, starting from the scratch in the current environment. But um, if I combine your question with the uh, with the other one, what can we learn from the IT industry? Well, the first thing, the overall thing we can learn is it works. Because if you look back 30 years ago, you had IBM. And if you had an IBM system, you need an IBM printer, an IBM keyboard, an IBM monitor, or Atari, or Commodore, or whatever. But it, there was no interoperability. It was a huge dependency. If you start with an IBM computer, every equipment, every um, other stuff, accessories have to come from IBM. And see where we are now. You can have a Samsung computer with a Hewlett Packard uh, printer with a mouse from whoever. So, and this, of course, more competition brings the prices down, more innovation. So you see, it works. It's proven. Yeah. And uh, maybe we will see a similar or comparable scenario, hopefully, in the network infrastructure. Thank you, Torsten. Manuel, any comments from your side? No, no, I agree completely. And I think, uh, as I say before, that the open run is the a way to follow. Not only the only way; it's not the only way, but for sure it, it will be one of the realities in the next in the next five years, for sure, right? So I rely and I I, I support the idea, and it is the way to reduce cost for operators and to increase the trust for the world community in the telco industry. Uh, thank you, Manuel. I have one final question, which is also, I mean, which also was highlighted in, in many papers uh, recently over the last couple of months, uh, the Rakuten example. Uh, does anyone want to comment on the Rakuten example? The Greenfield network built completely on, on open standards and open RAN? Yeah, so Rakuten, so we have a technology cooperation with Rakuten and partly we contribute to the hardware of Rakuten. But of course, it's very different if you build something greenfield than to change an existing network like a network from Telefonica, Vodafone, Deutsche Telekom. This is a real challenge. The challenge is not to build something from the scratch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's single band, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, we we are exactly on time. And uh, this is um, this is a great moment. It's a, it's the moment to say a big thank you to our fantastic speakers. You're welcome. Um, and under normal circumstances, this would be the time to give our speakers a big hand. 
So thank you very much for being with us um, and, and for, for sharing your views and insights. That's, that's great. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, this closes our discussion and I'm now giving the floor back to Jason Valley for closing remarks of our conference. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Georg. Uh, I'd like to echo your comments about this being a, a well, thanks for both sets of presenters and the webinar. It's been very excellent, very fascinating talks with raising lots of some issues. Very wide ranging set of issues have come up. Which sort of position cybersecurity within a, a wider, very dynamic sort of context, which is political, which is economic, which is social, and which is also sort of technical as well. And you know, you can describe this as a complex problem, but it's equally as a wicked problem where there's no real solution to the child to the questions being asked. And it will just continue forward, evolving as technology and the politics evolves. You know, the multiple dimensions, I think which both panels have touched upon, uh, gives us lots of things to think about, whether that's in terms of um, European investment and what do they invest in, the extent to which European um, investment can deliver tangible changes in the marketplace, and to how society evolves as we adjust to the new working environments around COVID, what that means in terms of flexibility and the need to invest and all the way through, of course, we have this nice, complex sort of um, international environment, which was a bipolar world, then became a hegemonic world, and is now evolving into something which is rather curious with the US and China on the one hand, and Europe slap down in the middle with a different sort of uh, set of circumstances that it is faced, facing for the first time. Gives us lots of things to think about, and lots of things to consider in the future and with a very shameless plug to the next year's ITS conference lots of things for people to write about and to submit abstracts to when the call for papers comes out so on that point I'd like to thank you all again and wish you all um, an enjoyable rest of the day wherever you are thank you very much <laughs>